Yes, I'm still doing sorting algorithms videos, despite the fact that, you know, I did my first video several years ago now. However, these are just one-off episodes to sort of just add on to what I already have, and that's why I'm calling this the tuition edition, which is just extra stuff, I guess. Today, what we're gonna look at is a simplification of quicksort. Now, when I explained quicksort to you on two different occasions now, the algorithm I presented was rather complicated. And even though it does its job and it does its job well, it's not very easy for a beginner to understand. What I'm gonna do today is I'm gonna show you a much simpler way to actually implement quicksort. However, not entirely as optimal. But yes, we'll get into this in its due course. Now, optimally, where you are at right now should be, well, you've watched up to the quicksort episode in the sorting algorithms redux series, so you won't be entirely lost when I actually do this particular episode. This video would be best for you if you have issues understanding what is actually going on in the quicksort episode. But yes, that is quite enough preamble. You are watching the tuition edition of sorting algorithms. So right, quicksort. Now, I want to actually cover the whole concept of quicksort once again from scratch. So here's the deal. The whole idea of quicksort is this. I have an unsorted list, and what I want to do is I want to actually partition this list into two different parts. To do this, I will pick a pivot, and for the remaining items, I will basically split them into two groups, either items that are smaller than a pivot, or items that are larger than a pivot. When I'm done with this, essentially what I have is, well, a list that looks like this. The pivot itself, which incidentally is already in the correct position in the entire sorted list, as well as two sublists, containing items that are smaller on the left, and items that are larger on the right. When we have our list like this, we continue applying this algorithm recursively to each sublist. If you go down to your left sublist and you create two sublists, then go down to the smaller left sublist again, and keep doing this until, well, essentially your sublist go down to size 1 or 0. After all the recursion is done, you come up with a sorted list. The algorithm we've looked at in the Sorting Algorithms Redux episode is essentially an algorithm that does everything within the same array. What this means is, by doing a series of clever swaps, you will actually be able to bubble your pivot to its correct position, and at the same time, create your two sublists, that is, well, smaller stuff on the left, larger stuff on the right. That is all well and good, in fact, that is awesome. But that is also rather difficult to understand. So instead, what we're gonna do is we're gonna actually use a far simpler, a far more intuitive approach to doing this. First, we pick a pivot. Now, like the previous version of Quicksort that we've already seen, we're just simply gonna use the first element. So right, now that we have our pivot, what we're going to do is we're going to actually iterate throughout the list. For every item we look at, we compare it to the pivot and we decide if that is smaller or larger than the pivot. We create two little cues to actually help us deal with this. If an item is smaller, then we put it into the smaller queue. If it's larger, then we put it into the larger. So when we're done with one pass of the algorithm, we have our pivot and we have two cues of numbers. This also creates two partitions, just like the more complicated version we've seen. What we can then do is we can reassemble the original array by grabbing all the smaller items and putting them in, taking the pivot and sticking it to the end of that, and then grabbing the larger items list and sticking it to the end of that as well. Essentially, at the end of your first pass, you've created your partitions, just like the other version of Quicksort. Similarly, we're just going to apply the same logic and go recursively into each sublist, first going to the left sublist, then to the right sublist. So for this sample list here, I'm just gonna very quickly, well, trace the entire algorithm. Essentially, the recursion behaves exactly in the same way as the normal quicksort. You recursively quicksort the left sublist. If that generates some more left sublist, then you go down further to the left sublist. When we've exhausted all the left sublists, then we'll actually move on to the lowest right sublist and start working from there. And essentially, well, once all the recursion is done, we should have our nice sorted list. So what's the time complexity of this algorithm? 
Well, since it behaves exactly like quicksort, you expect the time complexity to be the same. And that is true. This is an O and log n algorithm because, well, you look at n items, log n times. The reason why you get the log n, of course, comes from the divide and conquer nature of this algorithm. However, if you remember the original quicksort episode, then you'll know that n log n is the average time. There is a worst case scenario that will make quicksort go to O n square time and well this particular implementation of quicksort isn't exempt either. By giving quicksort a list that is either sorted or sorted inversely, well you fail to create one of the partitions. This remains true for both normal quicksort as well as this version we're looking at today. And in other words, you can still create your worst case O n square time complexity. However, I also told you about a little trick that will prevent this problem from happening, and that is to pick a random pivot. That works for normal quicksort, that also works for this version of quicksort. If for each pass of the algorithm you pick a random pivot, and simply just partition everything else like you normally would, then the worst case scenario actually disappears. You have to be really unlucky to encounter the worst case scenario once again, and that actually pushes the worst case time complexity of quicksort up to O and log n. So then the question is, why shouldn't we do things like this? Now, this is clearly a far easier way to actually understand quicksort, but there is a reason why this isn't the most commonly used method. And the reason for this is that we need additional data structures to help us keep track of these smaller and larger items. What this means is this algorithm is no longer in place. Now, recall the definition of in place. Essentially, if an algorithm is in place, it is able to do its job without using any external data structures. That's what it means by in place. Your algorithm runs in the place of the original array. Since this version of quicksort requires additional data structures to be created, it's not in place, and therefore is less optimal than the other version of quicksort we've seen. In fact, the space complexity of this version of quicksort is O n. Now, why do we say this? Take a look at your first pass of the algorithm. Essentially, you create two queues that add up to n minus 1 items. Why n minus 1? Well, this is your original list, it contains n items. The pivot doesn't go into any one of those two queues, but everything else does. That's why it's n minus 1. And under the big O notation, this becomes O n. This space complexity also means trouble because the larger your list, the more memory you're going to need to actually run this version of quicksort. The original version of quicksort has an O1 space complexity because whether you give it 10 items or 1000 items, well, you just have that couple of variables. That is your left pointer, your right pointer, and your pivot pointer. So yeah, that basically wraps it up for this episode of Sorting Algorithms, Tuition Edition. I hope this has given you better insight into how quicksort works Hopefully, this episode has given you a more gradual introduction to quicksort as opposed to just throwing you right into it, which was kind of what I did for the original version. Despite the fact that we've seen two different ways in which we can do quicksort, don't forget that ultimately the concept remains the same. The way I see it, the implementation is the less important part of an algorithm. In fact, what's more important about an algorithm is the concept behind how it works. How you actually implement it is less of an important issue. The key idea for quicksort is that you want to create two partitions. Then you want to recursively do the same for these partitions and you want to keep going on until there are no partitions left. So yeah, that basically wraps it up. That's basically all I have to say for this version of the algorithm. I hope you learned something today. Thank you very much for watching and until next time, you're watching 0612 TV. Hello, if you enjoyed this video, don't forget I appreciate every like, favorite, and comment you give me. If you'd like to see more from me in the future, don't forget to subscribe. For more updates outside of YouTube, do follow my official Twitter account at 0612TV. And if you'd like to see more of my work, you can also check out my About Me page. Once again, thank you very much for watching and until next time, you're watching 0612TV.